Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to Marriage Culture TV, where marriage and culture intersects. Today, we have one of the greatest couples ever that we're going to be discussing, Abraham and Sarah. I think even though I know some other folks who think that, you know, Boaz, Boaz's story is like one of the best ever, I think Abraham and Sarah was epic with everything that they did. Um, and I, I, for me, it, it, it is the love story for now until we go further. But right now, Abraham and Sarah. And um, we have so much to talk about them. Um, this is Nikki O. And the lovely lady over there smiling away is... <laughs> I'm Queen Apple. Yes, I am. <laughs> Listen, I totally forgot that I was supposed to be introducing um, her and introducing myself because I'm just so excited about what we have to share about um, Abraham and Sarah. So without any further delay, let me let um, Queen get into it. Okay, so on our lesson today on Abraham and Sarah, we're going to be reading from Genesis 18. Genesis 18 verse 1, I don't have my glasses on, but I will read it. It says, and this is the New Living Translation, the NLT. The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. One day, Abraham was sitting at the entrance um, to his tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them, welcomed them, bowed and low to the ground. Abraham said to them, my Lord, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you have said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, Sarah, hurry up, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough and bake some bread. Then Abraham ran to the herd, chose tender calf and gave it to his servant to prepare it. When the food was ready, Abraham brought the yogurt, etc., to the men. I'm summarizing here and um, gave it to them. Abraham waited on them in the shade of the tree. Verse 9. Where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you again this time next year, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, hmm, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my husband, my master, is also so old? Then the Lord said to Abraham, verse 13, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I will return again this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh, but the Lord said, yes, you did. Yes, you did. So this is just a little tidbit of Abraham and Sarah's story. And um, one of the things that I liked about it from the very beginning, and I, you know, we can just paraphrase and tell the story of the rest of it, how it ended up. They didn't have children. They were very old. Um, but this couple, they were still together even in their old age. So it meant that they realized that for whatever reason, um, that they didn't have child, whether it was the man's fault or the woman's fault or they're infertile. There's nowhere in the Bible that the Bible said that they were pointing fingers at each other. Um, but together they were in this boat of being delayed in childbearing. Um, and one thing I want to pick up from the story, Nikki, and then I'll, I'll stop talking, is that Abraham saw the visitors Right. He told him, you chill here. Let me get you some water to wash it, refresh you. Let me get you some food. He went to Sarah and he said, hey, Sarah, hurry up and bake some bread. Use your best flour, your best thing. Now imagine if that were to happen in this modern day home of ours. Our husband come in and said, hey, I saw some strangers outside. I want you to take the best of the best and make bread for them. Would we be so receptive? In that moment, I'm just thinking, Sarah was a humble wife. She was a submissive wife. She had a calm, gentle spirit. The Bible didn't say she rejected, like, like what, what? 
Strangers, you want me to take my best to feed strangers? Who are they? She didn't question it. Nikki? Man, I was just listening to that and just smiling. That was that was just so awesome. But you know, like one of the um the pointers that you brought up was that um no one was pointing fingers, you know, whether it was Sarah or Abraham, because maybe there was no need to point fingers because it was neither Sarah or Abraham. You know, like God does things that he does not want anybody to get the glory out of. And I think their marriage and that part of their story, their love story was just a part of it. You know, it didn't have to be anything that was wrong with Sarah and it didn't have to be anything that was wrong with Abraham. It was a God thing. It was a season, seasonal thing. And God decided when he wanted it to be done. Um, throughout the Bible, I don't see anywhere in it um, where it said that, you know, Sarah was barren or that Abraham had, was having any infertility issues. It just said that they just, just didn't have children at that time. And I know looking back in their culture, not having children was looked down on. So just imagine this beautiful woman um, getting married to this gorgeous guy. I think in, um, I can't remember exactly what Sarah means. Um, I think it means before their name was changed, the name Sarah was uh, princess, right? And Abraham was like the lifter or something like that. Um, exalted father, yeah. Exalted father. So here are these people in a in a culture and if we look, if we take it back to our day, it would be like, you know, when you see in media, they're like, okay, this is the 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 couple. This is our favorite couple. Abram and Sarah would be considered one of the favorite couples. She was beautiful. He was rich and handsome, you know, and they came from a well-to-do family, mm -hmm. you know. So here they are and everybody's like, oh my God, I can't wait to see what Sarah's children looks like. Or, oh my God, is he, is a boy going to look like Abraham? Is he going to get his eyes, his his you know, his stature, you know, are they going to be as intelligent as they are? Can you imagine Sarah's daughter, how beautiful she's going to be? And here they are going through time and time again, different episodes in their life, different seasons, different curveballs, you know, you know, corners, you know, however you want to put it and just different times in their life. And they're still waiting. But what makes the story so interesting for me, and then I'm going to hand it back over to, to Queen, is just their love for each other. Never once did you hear Sarah going at her husband. And the Bible said that they got married. We're expecting to, to um, you know, procre procreate. Is a, it was a part of the culture. It was um, um, a covenant that was given to them, you know, you will be fruitful, you will multiply. Everybody else had done it. Now it was your turn. And she's with her hubby and he's like, man, we got to leave and go somewhere else. You know, God has called me to something else. It never said that they were serving this God before. And she got up, she left with her husband and throughout everything, even the two times that she was taken, you know, and her husband asked her to do things that she wouldn't have done because of her love for her husband, because of her humility, because of her serve, servitude towards him. You know, um, a lot of people sometimes go back to, to Sarah and Abraham's relationship and be like, you know what, you should talk to your husband like this or act like that. She called him my Lord. You should be calling your husband my Lord, not babe, <laughs> you know, or anything like that. You should be serving him. You should be going on your knees and talking to him. That's how Sarah did it. You know, Sarah was just the coolest chick I can ever think of. You know, who in this time and, and season where you're married and you know that if you commit adultery or, you know, anything like that, you know, what could happen? In their culture, adultery was not just a punishment where you just go and, okay, you know what, yeah, I cheated on you. So, hey, you know what, let's just forgive each other and move on. In their culture, it meant death. And so here's this woman where twice in her life, standing beside her man, her husband, he said to her, you need to go and go chill with this king and this other pharaoh, you know, so I can live, you know, because I fear for my life. It never said anywhere that he feared for their lives. Mm -hmm. She was pretty. This is a pretty chick. And it, she was like, you know what? I'll do it. Just because you said so, honey bun, I will do it for you. And she goes in and she does it. And a lot of people sometimes in um, Genesis 12, they say that she did not sleep with Pharaoh. As far as I'm concerned, she did. In Genesis 20, 
where, you know, Abimelech, you know, when she went in with him, it said that before he got to her, God warned him in a dream. There was nothing like that in Genesis 12. So as far as I'm concerned, hey, but the girl did what she had to do for her husband. Awesome chick. I respect Sarah. I'm going to be talking to Sarah when I get to heaven and just you know, <laughs> hanging out with her and be like, how did you do it all these years? You know, and it wasn't to that point where she decided, hey, let's use my handmaid and have a child. And the way I see it, it was a, a it was like an adoption process. You know, you go in, you know, because it's not like, you know, you go in, it's going to be your seed. And when she has a baby, I'll adopt the baby and call it my own. And that was what happened because when she had the baby, you know, it seemed like, you know, everybody knew that it was Sarah's baby via adoption. But because mama was still around, mama was like, please, this is my beautiful son. I gave it to Abraham. He's a top notch. He's a he's top notch. He's a don. So what you gonna do you can't have babies and that was where the problem starts but seriously i love this couple i have so much but i'm gonna let athlean i see that she's wiggling her nose i know she has something that she wants to say go ahead queen <laughs> no 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 that, that that was a nice um expose in sarah but i wanted to um i, I guess come from the angle of god's promises to them yeah i'll bear here abraham was 99 years old when god appeared to him and sarah was 90 i believe right and when God, this was in Genesis 17, God said, I am going to make you a father of many nations. His name yeah. already, Abram, Abram at that time, meant exalted father. And I can just imagine like what flag they got from their community. Exalted father, where are your children? <laughs> I know, right? You know, and he said to, God said to um, Abraham, Abram at the time, he said, your name of them will be changed from Abraham to Abraham. Yeah. And don't call Sarai, Sarai anymore, which meant princess. Call her Sarah. It's A R H. Yeah. Right? So God was speaking into, he was speaking into their destiny. Yes. Um, yeah. So it, Sarah means princess. So he was speaking into their destiny and he said, I will make you or I've made you a father of many nations. I'm trying to find the exact scripture. Um. And he said that you and your descendants should be faithful. This is an everlasting promise to your generations, right? So sometimes learning from this, further on down, like Nikki mentioned, when Sarah said, look, okay, to bring God's promise to pass, we humans with our limited view and minute brain need to help this great God. Yeah. You go into my handmaiden and impregnate her and the rest, Nikki, you'd already said. And sometimes I think, out of impatience or we're trying to wrap our minds around how God is going to do it. We yeah. think is when God gives a promise, how he does it is none of our business. All we have to do is stand on his word. He said, I will make your father nations. Yes. Your son, you know, um, call his name Isaac. And um, all of these things, God gave, gave him a lot of information, you know, but um, human nature trying to figure it out, like, Okay, we need to help God. So this is just a reminder, I believe, from this story to take God at his word. Take his word back. The details of how he's going to bring it out, none of our business. Absolutely. God, your word says, I'm going to be a father of nation. Thank you, Lord, for my sons and my daughters and my many generations that you've already blessed. You know, God, your word says, I will be a, a fruitful mother, a joyful mother of children. Thank you for that. You know, so we take God at his word. Let leave the details to him. It's not always easy. I know that, especially in this day and age when there's so many different aspects. I have nothing against um, infer um what do you call it, fertility treatments. Right. And that thing, you know, back then, um, era Abraham went into the handmaiden. But now it's like you have surrogacy where they do it in the in the lab. <laughs> you know? Right, right. <laughs> children nothing is wrong with that um and god's promise came to pass and i always say you know if the if the couple goes through fertility treatment it's god that breathes life absolutely and it's god that gives life it's not the doctors they themselves are leaving tell you, okay we'll just sit and wait and see you know so it's just going back to taking god at his word knowing that he'll if he chooses to allow you to go through fertility treatment to have the children that's his choice but Adultery, fornication, 
lying, deception, that's never in God's plan. Never, ever in God's plan. And, you know, at the end of the day, yes, he had an Ishmael and we see the trouble even to this day that, you know, that came from that. But God's grace is still is still there for us. That even when we mess up, we can't go back and say, Lord, I'm sorry, help me. And he will. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I was just sitting back and just resting and I, you know, in the chair. And as I was doing that, I'm just like, you know, that is that is exactly what we need to do, resting in God's promises. Never once did we see God being, even when we're unfaithful, he's such a faithful God. He gave them a promise, you know, that he would multiply them, make their, you know, inheritance as numerous as the sand on the seashore. He would bless them and he indeed blessed them. Um, just going back to scripture, when when he met with Pharaoh, Sarah, Sarah and Abraham met with, with Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 12, they were given cattle, they were given slaves, you know, for everything. God was blessing them. When they met with Abimelech in Genesis 20, he was doing the same thing. You know, everything that God promised them, he fulfilled, you know, and that's just one of the things we have to understand whatever God says to you, whatever his word says, he will fulfill his promise to you, you know, and, and that's just, just the whole story behind Abraham and Sarah for me, you know, cool couple. Oh my goodness. When I meet them, hmm, I'm just going to ask them some questions. <laughs> and not once in their life, sorry, queen, not once in their life. Did I, did you see anywhere where God was like upset with Abraham or upset, upset with Sarah because of the choices that they made. You know, he understood, you know, their sure. minds. He understood what they were going through. And he still showed up and showed out for them, you know. And, Ooh, kept, his promise. and, kept, mm -hmm. his, and kept his promise. Absolutely kept his promises, you know. So just a, a word of encouragement to whoever we are. There's so many people who are out there, they've been married for years, maybe 19, 20, 25, 26, 30 years, still believing God for the fruit of the womb. And um, if, we, if, we, if we look at the media and just the stories that are going on, it doesn't even matter if you've just been married yesterday. It doesn't matter if it's been five, 10 years or however it is, God is still showing up for his people in this area. You know, like um, last week, if you watched our... Um, or YouTube, if you didn't, you need to go back where we dealt with Abraham, sorry, we dealt with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, man, showed you the foundation of what marriage should be. And if your marriage is based on that, no matter what you're going through, just keep the faith and know that God will do what he said he will do in your marriage. He will make you fruitful. You will multiply and you will replenish the earth, queen. Yes, so thank you. We have reached the end of this week's recording. Um, tune in next week when we talk about drum roll, Isaac and Rebecca. We mm -hmm. will study on Isaac and Rebecca. That's our nice. um, couple that we will talk about. So we again want to thank you for joining with us today. Let us know in the comment section your take on Abraham and Sarah. What lessons you've learned from their life, and um, you know, just basically how uh, how you feel about this, this discussion. Thank you once again. This is Marriage Culture TV. Please follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. You know, um, we are here and we're here to stay. May God bless you. I'm Queen Eileen. This is Nikki. Oh, have an awesome week.